Well, uh, happy Thursday morning, everyone. If uh, anybody happens to be out there listening or watching, uh, if you could post a comment in the uh, comment section to make sure I'm coming through clear and you can hear me and see me. Um, my name is Sadler Taylor. Uh, I'm the curator of folk life and field work here at McKissick Museum. Uh, gosh, I've been here for, oh, almost 20 years. I started here in uh, January 2001. I was a South Carolina native. Uh, went off to uh, a school in Kentucky, Western Kentucky University, um, and was fortunate enough to come back home, come back to South Carolina in 2001, and I've uh, been thrilled to, to be here ever since. Um, there is uh, there's a question here about uh, basically how did I become a curator at McKissick? Uh, and that was not a, a direct path, uh, shall we say. Uh, I have a, an art history background uh, in that I have an undergraduate degree in art history. And then I took a little break from school and uh, did what most people did. I uh, explored a variety of things. I was a private investigator for a little while. Um, and then uh, my art history focus uh, back in my undergraduate years was on architecture and architectural history. So. Uh, I really became interested in historic preservation and the built environment. Uh, so decided to go back to school and went to a, a wonderful folklore program at Western Kentucky University in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, they have a historic, historic preservation program there in their folklore uh, department. So got a degree uh, in folklore with a uh, focus on historic preservation. Worked in historic site work for a couple of years and then really became uh, interested in the people behind the buildings. Uh, I worked at a historic site of a Shaker community in Kentucky. Uh, that was a community that was very very rich in a lot of uh, internal Shaker traditions. Furniture making, cooking, um, farming, uh, and this was a community that uh, phased out or, or left the community uh, in the early 20th century, uh, and then so we were interpreting the buildings, interpreting the site, and I really developed a passion for who were these shakers, what made them tick, why did they uh, make furniture like they did. So I fell back on that folklore degree and in the applied sense, <coughs> excuse me, really wanted to find something uh, that could explore contemporary uh, traditional culture. Uh, that's about the time the job at McKissick opened up, and here I am. Um, so in 2001, I moved back to South Carolina and uh, started working with the Folklife Resource Center at McKissick Museum. Uh, so a lot of people ask me what, what exactly is the Folklife Resource Center, or as it's affectionately called, the uh, FRC. Uh, well, McKissick Museum was, was founded in 1976, uh, and from the very beginning, uh, McKissick was focused on uh, Southern culture, telling the story of Southern life, uh, and what does that mean? Um, a lot of uh, field work was done, a lot of projects were done in the very beginning that focused on uh, long-standing traditions within South Carolina, uh, namely Sweetgrass Baskets. It was one of the first projects that the museum uh, as an institution took on and was really um, in the forefront of uh, research with uh, not just sweetgrass basketry, but the makers, what these sweetgrass basket makers were, were doing, why they were doing it. Um, so about nine years later, fast forward to 1985, the museum had all of this documentation, whether it's uh, photographs, audio recordings, video, uh, 
paper ephemera, field notes. Well, what do you do with it? Uh, so the, the museum leadership at the time decided we need to establish an archive that uh, manages all of this material. So in 1985, the Folklife Resource Center was established and it became the home for uh, all of the field work that had been done uh, up to that point in uh, the museum's experience. Uh, so that was the beginning of what would become uh, quite the dynamic repository of uh, materials. Um, audio, like I said, audio, video, uh, field notes, um, and it's, it's grown since that time. Um, we have a question here. Well, hello, Liz Wakefield, uh, former uh, FRC graduate assistant and McKissick uh, uh, student extraordinaire. She asked, um, or more of a statement, and I'll read it for everybody, Liz, so everybody can. Uh, the FRC and uh, South Carolina Broadcasting Archive are great resources, uh, but I, I agree. They are great resources, and I especially agree with this point, but Sadler is perhaps the best of the three. Hey, I will take that compliment, and I appreciate it, Liz. Liz worked with us for uh, several years, and I did a, a great job uh, on an exhibit a couple years ago that uh, really explored in depth uh, folk medicine uh, and African American influence on medicine uh, in the Low Country. Uh, miss you too, Liz. Um, so uh, that is is how I got to McKissick, and that is the background on the the Folklife Resource Center. Uh, it's really a unique archive. Uh, there's not really another museum, university museum, in the southeast that uh, takes the approach we do to exploring, celebrating, uh, and uh, researching and interpreting southern culture uh, and all of its complexities. Um, so, so it's a great environment, uh, and, and fortunate to work with the staff uh, that, I, that I work with. Um, I have a question here. What does field work mean, and how do you decide what is important enough to be recorded? Uh, well, field work can take many different forms. It's not necessarily um, going out uh, on site. Um, to do um, uh, some sort of documentation, which normally that is what it involves, uh, going out to where uh, these folk artists, these traditional artists are, uh, meeting them where they are, and whether it's a musician. Um, I've done a lot of recordings in churches with gospel choirs or um, spiritual uh, folks that sing spirituals. Um, whether that's a single person singing a solo um, or a, a full gospel choir. So um, my approach to field work is to try to capture um, the, the material, the tradition, uh, whether it's verbal, music, or craft-based, um, capture it where, it where it is performed or where it is created. Um, and to me, that involves, first and foremost, uh, building a, a relationship with uh, that particular artist. Field work to me is all about relationships. It's, there's not a beginning and an end to me. I don't uh, call someone, show up, uh, record an audio interview, and then leave and never see that person again. So uh, I know when I first I got out of school and starting do, uh, started doing audio interviews, doing field work, I would never bring my recording equipment with me on that first visit. Because to me, again, it was about getting to know this person, uh, letting them know that I'm interested in them and their tradition, uh, what makes them tick, and just getting to know them as a person. Uh, and that lasted, that approach lasted for a little while, uh, but then I, I started noticing that I would make that first visit, and in many cases, 
by the time I could get back to visit with that person, they would pass away. Uh, that happened on numerous occasions where, uh, unfortunately, in, in this line of work, a lot of times you're working with um, senior master artists or master musicians that have been doing this their, their whole lives. And uh, by the time you get to them, to sit down with them and talk to them, uh, they've got a lifetime behind them of uh, doing what they've done. And so it only took a, a couple of these wonderfully talented artists to uh, pass away for me to change that approach. Uh, and I just decided to put all the, the recording equipment in my trunk and uh, show up. And if things went well and played each one by ear, uh, then you would, you would get out all the recording equipment and things would be great. Um, and I tell you, technology has helped helped a lot. Um, I was never, uh, I am not going to date myself, but I'm not old enough to have used a Niagara recorder in the field, uh, but if anybody out there uh, uh, recognizes that name, you know it's a big, heavy, uh, reel-to-reel uh, tape recorder, uh, and it was the professional standard uh, from the 70s through the, even the late 80s. Uh, and it was technically portable. Uh, I would show it to you today, but it's uh, on exhibit upstairs. But I do have, uh, a, I'm sure you're familiar with reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape, but uh, this was the professional standard uh, up through the 80s. So you would strap on this, uh, this Niagara was probably, um, you know, as big as a, a small suitcase. You strap that on, have your mic, go out into the field, and it was a little cumbersome. So uh, I see that somebody asked, um, what is your, your favorite tool uh, that you use um, on your job? And in thinking about that, I would have to say, uh, in general, my favorite tool is the, the, the idea of technology. Um, the I can move like a ninja with the recording equipment that we have today. Unlike the 10 or 15 pound Niagara of uh, days gone past, um, I'll give you a little timeline here. From the Niagara, we uh, did not go directly to this. After the Niagara, we went to cassette recorders, which were about this size, as big as my head. Uh, but this is the same size, but it's a, a mini disc recorder. You can see that there. Again, a professional standard uh, through uh, probably the 90s into the early 2000s. And if you're not familiar with a, a mini disc, there you go, right there. Mini disc. Not a bad format. Uh, it's stable. You can put this in this recorder and you can get on a motorcycle, get on a horse, do whatever you want to do. It's not going to skid up, it's not going to mess up the recording. Uh, so it's a pretty handy format. But folks generally did not take to them. They weren't popular for more than a, a few years. But they did reduce the weight of your recorder and they even made them that are, you know, not much bigger than the disc itself. So, lightweight, allowed you to get around, uh, so good things, right? Then we, uh, actually prior to many discs, there was something called digital audio tape. There's a little DAT tape, excellent format, came in a recorder about the size of the mini disc recorder I just showed you. Um, but now we've uh, progressed to the uh, solid state digital audio recorder lightweight. This thing can fit in my shirt pocket. Uh, records straight to the device on a hard drive. Then you just uh, plug this little fella up to your computer, transfer it like a uh, like you're transferring a, a document or a file through a USB or firewire connection and you can start your editing. 
unlike these little fellows or the DAT tapes, which when you transferred them to do any editing or save them, it was a real-time transfer. So if you had a one-hour recording, it's going to take you an hour to transfer that into your computer. Um, so that was just a real quick little progression uh, on field work technology. Uh, so uh, Cliff Note says we've gone from very heavy and cumbersome uh, that really took a lot of uh, thought to as far as setup to something that's extremely lightweight where I can record with either the onboard mics there or I can still plug in on the uh, XLR I can plug in more uh, microphones with better capability and really get um, a good solid recording. So I would say recording technology is probably my favorite tool uh, and I feel a little spoiled now. Uh, I appreciate the folks, the folklorist, uh, the anthropologists that came before me uh, and the extremely cumbersome materials that uh, equipment that they had to, to use uh, to capture that information. Uh, hey there, John Thomas Fowler, who's out there uh, watching and commenting. Uh, good to hear from you and and I uh, hope things are going well. Same with uh, Wayne Turner up in uh, Pickens. I uh, hope things are going going well. Uh, two uh, very uh, talented musicians, I, I must say. Um, let's see, what else do we have? We've got another question here. I hope that answered your uh, field work question. Um, I talked a lot about the technology and the recording aspect of it, but again, if you don't take anything else out of that, uh, it's to me about relationships and uh, sometimes taking it slow and uh, building those relationships that are going to be long lasting and uh, 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 getting to know those artists and those people and then maintaining those relationships and uh, uh, really gathering information about uh, what makes that person tick, why that particular tradition or traditions are important to them, uh, who they learn from, and are they interested, are they passing it on to, to other folks. Um, on that vein, I have a photograph here. Be right back. Speaking of uh, family traditions, and I guess I should take a step back and um, you know, a lot of people ask me, what, what is this folk life stuff? What is, what is folklore? What is it? And um, I usually tell them, well, it's a very scientific term made up of two very uh, complex words. One is folk and one is lore. Folk meaning people and lore meaning stuff. People and stuff. That's what it boils down to. What things what aspects of a particular uh, group of people make them unique, make them tick? Uh, what aspects of culture make that culture, you use, we can use the word a cultural marker, what makes them distinct, what makes them unique uh, from uh, another group of people? Whether that's a family unit, uh, a community, a region, a state, Folk life can go from the macro level, national, down to a very micro level. Um, so that to me is what um, makes people uh, unique and makes the culture groups that they are a part of unique. But um, so this is a good example, I think. I'll show you this picture. Uh, there we go. This is the Smith family from uh, Greenville County and uh, now have settled really in Anderson County, Honeypath area. But I want you to look at this fella right here. That's Alda Smith, uh, who is uh, an FHA recipient. And then these are his three older brothers. Uh, so they're in their house. They're in one of the uh, brothers' bedrooms. And every single person has an instrument. And I just love all this expression down here. Uh, I believe he told me he was playing a uh, dobro. That's why you can't see it. 
but this kind of personifies um, folk life and that transmission of um, traditions like that. The, the, the Smith family is very musical. They learned, uh, it was passed down from their father, Ralph Smith, who was a uh, uh, musician uh, through the, the 30s and into the 40s. Uh, took his guitar with him to World War II when he was drafted and went to uh, Europe. Uh, came back and all of his boys picked up um, not only his uh, passion for music, but their community's passion for music and their friends. And they all learned an instrument. And it's a great picture of Alda sitting there picking up tunes from them. And that informal trans transmission, that's how, that's how you learn this, this folklore and folk life stuff. And it's the same thing, uh, same situation when you've got a gospel choir that has young members and older members. Those young members are picking up uh, nuances from those older members and carrying on that tradition. So uh, photographs can be a real powerful way to capture that and uh, to communicate that to um, uh, other folks outside of that, that community. Uh, let's see here. What's been your favorite project to work on while I've been here at McKissick? Well, ooh, that's like... Uh, I kind of like trying to name your favorite child. Uh, you love them all for different reasons. I've been fortunate to um, work on some really, really fun projects. Uh, probably, let me see, I think I have a little visual aid. Back in, I guess it was 2007, uh, I did, worked on a a film documentary with uh, Stan Woodward, uh, a great, great friend and colleague up in Greenville, who uh, uh, had spent a storied career uh, doing uh, a variety of films. Uh, but his true passion was uh, Southern culture documentaries and telling that story of Southern life through uh, the lens of the camera. Uh, and we did a documentary in, I think it was 2007, on uh, a stew called Burgoo, B-U-R-G-O-O. -O. Uh, and that, it's a stew that is really uh, now um, really limited to Kentucky. It is, uh, I don't know if it's the official Kentucky stew of Kentucky, but uh, very, very popular in Kentucky, very well known in Kentucky. Uh, and in a small little community in West Virginia, um, not surprisingly called Burgoo, but spelled B-E-R-G-O-O. -O. Um, but anyway, it, it was a fascinating trip through Kentucky. We basically got in his car. Uh, we had a lot of contacts in Kentucky with the uh, Kentucky Historical Society, Kentucky Heritage Council, uh, with folklorists up there built a real a good network. Um, uh, the late John Edgerton was a key part of that project. Uh, it was really an a, a, a interesting journey through Kentucky, meeting with folks at barbecue restaurants, at festivals, and really kind of digging down into what makes this stew so important. Why do most folks in Kentucky connect with this particular food way? And this is a food way that is made for lots and lots of people, cooking it in big cast iron pots, uh, cooking it for, for hundreds of people at a time. Uh, there's some great historical photos of these big political rallies uh, with folks cooking uh, burgoo. Uh, not so different from similar things in other southern states, uh, hash in South Carolina, uh, Brunswick stew in Georgia and North Carolina and Virginia, uh, but uh, the people that we met doing that documentary were just really uh, very memorable. And I'll always remember this one particular restaurant in uh, Kentucky called the Shady Rest, and they had this menu that I really liked. You can see it. Little Mary had some lamb, won't you have some too? Um, 
as she looks lovingly at that little lamb that's probably going to become an ingredient in a big pot of ragout. But uh, so they have a sense of humor up that way. Um, so that was one of my favorite projects, but uh, I have several, uh, and, and several of them uh, involve just maintaining relationships with with folks that I've met over the years uh, and doing projects here at McKissick uh, and off-site. Uh, the Gene Laney Harris Folk Heritage Award program has always been uh, a favorite of mine. Uh, being able to recognize folks um, throughout the state that have been doing and contributing to the identity of South Carolina for their entire lives. That's always very rewarding to uh, see that, uh, see them get recognized uh, outside of their own community. Uh, but to see the, uh, I don't want to say it uh, legitimizes their uh, tradition, but it really kind of puts um, it well, the word escapes me, um, but it, it is a way that uh, the state can really acknowledge uh, the contributions of these folks, and uh, um, at a at a macro level within the, the state government. But uh, one of those folks that I've really enjoyed working with over the years is a, a woman by the name of Pat Aaron's. Uh, and Pat is really the um, she should be the official. Uh, bluegrass music historian of South Carolina, uh, but she's certainly uh, the uh, 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 unofficial. Uh, she has written countless books on uh, musicians with roots in the Midlands uh, and beyond. Uh, I've got, I hope I don't embarrass her, but I've got a photograph over here. That's Pat. Um, she received the, the Jean Laney Harris Award in 1996, uh, the Advocacy Award for bluegrass, bluegrass music uh, history and culture. And she, over the years, has donated hundreds, excuse me, hundreds of uh, pieces of ephemera from uh, kind of documenting bluegrass in the southeast from, my goodness, the 60s through, uh, you know, uh, today. But uh, whether it be bluegrass uh, flyers, uh, festival announcements, ticket stubs, uh, newspaper clippings. So it's uh, through folks like uh, Pat that we, we get a, a real broad, detailed story on uh, a particular tradition within uh, the region. Uh, things like this. This is a, a uh, flyer for a festival. See, this was at the uh, first bluegrass festival with the Hampton County Watermelon Festival. Uh, those of us from the state know that there's a festival for every vegetable and every fruit throughout the state. But this is the Hampton County Watermelon Festival. Uh, sponsored by the Estill JCs, and you've got uh, you've got some big names on here. If you if you can see, I don't know if you can see who that is, but that's Lester Flat. So we had on uh, Friday, June 25th, uh, you got Lester Flat, you got Charlie Moore, Bill Haney, Jim and Jesse, uh, and then on Saturday the 26th, you got uh, Jim and Jesse again, Charlie Moore. And then if you see at the very bottom, see the Lucas and Harmon brothers and Snuffy Jenkins and Pappy Sherrill. So you've got some good South Carolina talent in that mix. And this was in, uh, see this was June of 1971. So, uh, you know, by 1971, Snuffy Jenkins and Pappy Sherrill had been playing music, uh, oh gosh, since since the early 30s uh, throughout uh, the Midlands. Snuffy was from North Carolina, but moved down 
uh, into the Midlands early on and uh, were just quintessential uh, musicians on first radio and then TV and then played uh, uh, you know the rest of their lives in the Midlands area um, and Pappy incidentally he, he passed away in 2001 a uh, wonderfully humble fella uh, even though he was probably one of the best fiddle players to ever pick up a fiddle uh, he played right out front of McKissick for our festival, Folk Life Festival, in October of 2001, and I believe he passed away in November or December of 2001. So, uh, both of them, music was just absolutely their life, and they they played it right up until they they passed away. Uh, so, fortunately, we've got folks like Pat, who their life's passion is to document this material and to, to save things like these uh, festival flyers that provide a snapshot of what was going on uh, at that time in, in that community. Um, back to Pappy, I talked about him being a staple on WIS-TV here in Columbia. Uh, they started out when uh, uh, WIS Radio playing on the radio and then transitioning to television when television came around there's this is Pappy right here on the fiddle uh, getting ready for a spot on the television uh, he played with numerous musicians uh, throughout the, the region uh, but you know I've got some favorites here from the archive Got a lot of good stuff, and uh, I love getting it out. This is this is a, an album that Pappy and Snuffy did uh, several years back. Pappy on my right, Snuffy with uh, the infamous washboard on my left. Snuffy was a uh, a banjo picker, um, and I know at John. Fowler, if you're still out there listening, uh, John is a uh, quite an accomplished banjo picker as well. And I believe, John, you uh, you have a special passion for the claw hammer style, which is the earlier style of banjo picking. Uh, and Snuffy came along and really was uh, uh, the pioneer in the three finger style of banjo picking uh, that his friend Earl Scruggs would go on to really popularize. You know, you think about three finger banjo, you think about Earl Scruggs, you think about that rapid fire delivery, uh, and that really is what a, a, a major aspect of what made bluegrass, uh, gave bluegrass that unique sound. Uh, obviously combined with um, Bill Monroe, father of bluegrass, and his, his mandolin playing, but Snuffy was really one of the first to do the three finger style. You can hear it in his recordings. It's, it's uh, as John Fowler can attest to, it's, it's a different sound than, than claw hammer. Um, a little bit, uh, well not a little bit, but a, a good bit faster tempo. Just a different way of playing. And uh, Snuffy, it's uh, funny, I think Snuffy, I think his banjo was probably bigger than Snuffy. He was a diminutive little fellow, but uh, a, a huge, huge personality. Um, if you see, if you had ever seen Snuffy and Pappy play together, uh, Pappy always played the 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 straight straight shooter, and Snuffy always played the the prankster, the jokester. He was always pulling jokes, being goofy, and so they had a good interplay between each other. Real good, real good fit. Um, so, and then another, another local, uh, fella that was very unique with, uh, his South Carolina music story was, uh, Claude Casey, who was from, uh, Johnston down in Edgefield County area, and he, uh, played Western Swing. He ran a radio station down in Johnston and really played, he modeled his music after 
Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. Uh, Claude's band name was Claude Casey and the Pine State Playboys. Uh, so another unique uh, part of South Carolina music history that, uh, again, through folks like Pat Aarons and other folks that have uh, worked with us on archival collections and donating materials, we can really tell that that story. Uh, I've got a question here from uh, Edward Blessing, who uh, another past uh, graduate student. Um, let's see, he says, uh, Sadler, I know you're a South Carolina barbecue expert. Well, I like to eat it uh, in mass quantities. Uh, can you address what some might perceive as the decline of the local Q joint and the rise of the specialty chain. I mean, there are lots of little cinder block joints that have gone out of business. Uh, yeah, that is that is true. Um, very good question, Edward. And uh, the the as we know, the restaurant business is uh, extremely uh, tough business to break into, uh, and that's that's long before. Uh, the current environment out there today, uh, which makes it even harder, uh, obviously. But um, I, as far as the um, decline, I, I don't know if I don't think I would say the local barbecue restaurant is in decline. Um, from what I've seen, and I don't beat the barbecue pavement like I like I used to, um, but in my travels, I still see a lot of the, um, what I'll call kind of standard uh, or iconic local barbecue joints are still out there, uh, and some of them are, have even kind of expanded. Uh, I think about uh, Scott's Barbecue in, uh, outside of Hemingway, uh, I believe his son has opened up uh, a restaurant in the Charleston area, and and Scotts is, um, Scotts is like the perfect uh, example of a family barbecue joint that does it the right way, has developed a wide following, but has maintained their very humble roots. In fact, the last time I was down that way, I think Scotts still had just three or four tables in their uh, dining room. So more of a takeout operation. Um, so, I, you know, there's a, there's a place, um, if you're from the Midlands, or if you live in the Midlands, you've certainly heard of Hudson's Barbecue over in Lexington, uh, between Lexington and Columbia, and Hudson's years and years ago started in a, a, a storage shed that was about as big as my office here. and. To say they've been successful is, uh, I would say, an understatement. Their their operation now is it's huge, but I don't think they've lost their identity. I think they uh, uh, have just found a way to be really successful uh, and and cook some good barbecue. But then, uh, the same token, <coughs> excuse me, you've got a, a place like uh, Roy's in Lexington proper that is a small uh, restaurant uh, that's inside of an Exxon station, uh, right there on uh, Main Street in Lexington, uh, who I would drive from Charlotte to get to Roy's to get some of their food. Uh, very modest, very unassuming, uh, type of place that you don't even know it's there if you're not pointed there by a local. You don't stumble upon this place. Uh, I, I would surmise that if you pulled up there for gas, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't notice it. Um, but excellent barbecue. So I think, uh, Edward, to answer your question, I think you might have to look a little harder today than you used to, uh, because there certainly have been uh, mom and pop uh, barbecue joints that have closed down, but I found when one shuts down, sometimes two more pop up 
in other areas. So I think you just have to, to look a little harder. One thing I have noticed, and I'm not, I don't want to beat the barbecue course too much because it's getting close to lunchtime and frankly that will make me hungry. But um, one thing I have noticed is that like with other things, the world has gotten really, really small. Uh, amazingly small. And I would say as, as far back as 10 or 15 years ago, a lot of barbecue restaurant owners got smart to this. And, and this leads in, there's another question that somebody submitted about uh, how did mustard-based barbecue become popular uh, in the Midlands rather than vinegar or ketchup-based. And I will come in on that. Uh, that's a good segue. The world has gotten smaller. So barbecue restaurants that used to just serve mustard-based, and in fact, a lot of barbecue restaurants used to not give you a choice. They put the sauce on for you, and you were happy to get it. You didn't add sauce to unsauced barbecue. That was a part of the cooking, or not the cooking process, but post-cooking, a lot of places would go ahead and sauce their meat, and then you got it on your plate. Well, a lot of barbecue restaurants wised up and realized, hey, we've got people from not from around here that are used to mustard base. Say you're in the upstate. Well, we've got people that are, they're wanting mustard base or mustard sauce or they're wanting vinegar sauce. So you'd start to see barbecue restaurants put different sauces out on the table. So if you've got somebody from out of town that's used to a certain type of sauce, you're not forcing them to eat your local sauce depending on the region you're from, you gave them that option. Uh, and I can't remember exactly when that happened, but I remember being at a restaurant that normally was very much associated with vinegar-based, and there was a little squeezed bottle of mustard-based sauce and ketchup-based sauce. And I, at first I didn't know what it was, and then realized, ah, they're providing you options. So I think a lot of barbecue places are, are they're very, they're very sophisticated in their thinking, and they understand uh, what they have to do to survive. They're not compromising on their standards or their quality, but they're providing other options. That's why I think you start to see um, brisket offered at some South Carolina barbecue places now. Um, brisket, what? Beef? Pork is traditionally king in South Carolina. Uh, beef was not ever on the barbecue menu, but I would say within the past really 20 years, certainly 15, 10 years, you can go to a barbecue restaurant now and a lot of them, unless they truly are a local cinder block joint that has a very dedicated local following, you can probably find beef brisket. Now that's a big, that's a big change. Uh, I think Hudson's in Lexington has it and quite good actually, but just not something that uh, is typically, uh, it's not rooted, deeply rooted in South Carolina barbecue history. Uh, let's see, hello Kate Crosby, glad to see you uh, over there uh, watching and listening. Um, but I hope that uh, answered uh, the uh, person that asked about um, mustard-based. Um, historically, in the Midlands, uh, that most of the folks I talk to and the reading I've done and what I see pretty strong ties to is the German, uh, uh, the German influence uh, in the Midlands. Uh, a lot of uh, Germans came and settled in the um, Dutch Fork area of the Midlands and in Lexington, uh, you'll see uh, words like uh, Saxa Gotha uh, for several churches in um, uh, Lexington and then uh, Dutch Fork, which is just a uh, kind of uh, Americanized, uh, uh, it wasn't the Dutch, it was the Deutsch or German. Uh, so uh, a lot of folks, myself included, attribute that mustard base to the barbecue, to the, that early German influence in the Midlands. And then uh, 
you know, for the most part, you got vinegar on the uh, the coast and the PD, and then in the upstate, you typically got ketchup based. But again, that that's a uh, that's a norm that is uh, becoming very gray now, very shaded uh, because of how people move around and uh, traditions disseminate and um, spread their tendrils out. Uh, there's a great barbecue place in Liberty called Circle M Barbecue. Marion Davis, I believe, is his name, if I remember correctly. Well, he's in Liberty, which if you know the upstate, Liberty is not in the low country. It's, uh, I believe Liberty is, is Pickens County, or it might even be Oconee County not far from Pendleton, uh, deep in the upstate of South Carolina where typically, again, you got ketchup-based barbecue. But uh, uh, they, they serve vinegar-based. And when I was sitting down with talking to uh, Mary and I asked him the obvious question, hey, what's, what's the deal with this vinegar-based barbecue? And I uh, said, well, my wife is from Lake City, uh, Lake City being uh, not technically the low country, but uh, the uh, PD down around uh, Hemingway near where Scott's is and her family had a vinegar based barbecue recipe and she really wanted me to use it so that's what he used and it became very popular so he might I'm sure he's not the only barbecue restaurant in the upstate that serves vinegar based but uh, it's one of the few that I've I've come across um, so yeah, Edward, definitely get out to uh, Roy's. You will not be um, disappointed. Uh, not only barbecue, but oh man, collard greens. Uh, well, anyway, it's good. Uh, well, hey there, Janae. Uh, Janae Epps uh, asked, uh, do you think the influence of plant-based eating is affecting traditional southern food ways? Uh, hmm, that's a good, good question, Janae. Um, you could approach it from many different uh, angles, I suppose. Uh, I would argue that Southerners have always enjoyed plants. Um, collard greens, okra, um, you know, tomatoes, uh, but I'm, I'm just poking at you. I, I know what you mean. Um, and I, you know, I don't, um, I don't know, I see, um, I see Southerners and you know, outside of the South, certainly being affected and many embracing what we've been doing for a long time with backyard gardens, community gardens, you know, I don't, <coughs> excuse me, I don't think community gardens are a new phenomenon in the South. I think we've been doing that for uh, a long, long time. Uh, now, we haven't been making our hamburgers out of uh, plant-based products for a long, long time, um, but uh, I don't, to me, it's about process. <clears throat> excuse me. And I think, excuse me, for health reasons, for uh, whatever, you know, social-based reasons, uh, on a macro level, I think uh, some people are embracing plant-based uh, foods that would normally uh, be uh, meat-based. Uh, but I think at the local level, I think with um, the family table, I think for the uh, large part, uh, Southerners, at least in rural South Carolina, rural South, are still eating, um, you know, what's, uh, not necessarily what's grown in the garden, because that is a bit nostalgic and not everybody has a garden. Uh, but from a folkloric standpoint, what I find important is the, the process of cooking. Uh, which requires interaction, which requires, um, you know, again from the folkloric perspective, using recipes that are rooted in family history, community history. And a lot of people will ask me, well, how long does something have to be rooted in tradition to be considered a tradition? And to me, it comes down to a matter of um, value. How is, how is that particular activity valued? by the community that engages in that tradition. If it's only been going on two years, but it is an extremely important, has become an extremely important part 
of that family's identity, of what they do, then I would say that that is well on its way to becoming uh, traditional in nature. Uh, time will tell. And hindsight's twenty twenty, but uh, I, I think. Um, I have very little experience with plant-based eating when it comes to, uh, you know, substituting what were typical ingredients for something that's plant-based. I'm not adverse to it, I just don't have uh, the uh, experience with it or the, uh, if I can figure out how to make a hamburger out of okra, I would do it in a heartbeat. Um, you know, uh, so, uh, but I haven't seen that trend affecting the people that I talk to, affecting what they what they eat. Um, don't know the reasons for that. Uh, so, Janae, I probably did not answer your question, or if I did, I went a really long way around to answer it. But um, that's a good question, though, um, and. Uh, uh, one that warrants, you know, some further investigation. I'd be interested to, to travel back around to the folks that I've talked with that um, were cooking hogs or running barbecue joints or meat and three type places and, and find out, hey, your clientele that comes in, do you have people asking for alternatives? Uh, do you have people asking for, uh, you know, not necessarily plant-based stuff, but, you know, gluten-free. I mean, what types of new uh, culinary requirements are you finding that your <coughs> clientele are asking for? Or are they not? Do people who have gluten allergies just not go to barbecue restaurants? I don't know. It'd be a good question to uh, a good question to, to ask. Um, time is running a little short, but I have another question here. Um, let's see. Are there any exhibits that you're working on right now? Well, um, yes is the short answer. Um, still, uh, the, the last exhibit that I worked on with the staff here was uh, piece by piece. Uh, the, the quilts from the permanent collection uh, exhibit that really uh, uh, got kind of uh, came to a halt two-thirds of the way through. Uh, because of uh, COVID, uh, so that exhibition is not done. Uh, it's it's down right now, but uh, the plan is to install the third iteration of that exhibition uh, in January, uh, late January. So uh, we really um, wanted to get those remaining quilts out. Uh, these were, for folks that don't know, this was an exhibit that um, focused on a quilt from our collection that had never been on exhibition before. Uh, and we tried to find uh, quilts that um, we knew who the maker was and we could explore a little bit at least about what, that, what made that maker tick, who that maker was. For the most part, female uh, quilters. We do have one male quilter in, in the, the the exhibition, but you know, I was very interested in. Um, for the most part, these women were anonymous in the historical record, and uh, while the quilts are beautiful visually, uh, and they stand alone, really as as works of uh, art. I, I really wanted to find out more about the makers. Uh, so, you, you know, we've got about 16 quilts in each iteration, and each group had between four to six that we knew who the maker was. So, anyway, that will be coming in January, the third iteration of uh, 15 to 16 quilts, uh, and will be up uh, through most of the spring. And then following that, I've been working on a project with uh, custom uh, bladesmiths and knife makers in uh, South Carolina and North Carolina and that exhibition is due to open um, in uh, August of 21 and that will feature uh, some FHA uh, recipients 
uh, and folks from both Carolinas. So bladesmithing is something that we haven't actively uh, pursued on uh, an exhibition-based project since I've been here. So uh, that's what's, that is what is on the horizon. Um, and I will try to answer one more question here. Um, viewer asked, what's the one thing you wish people knew about McKissick Museum? Um, I, would, I would say McKissick is really, um, what makes McKissick McKissick is the staff. I'm fortunate to, to work with some people that are uh, just truly passionate about um, not only the mission of the museum to, you know, tell the story of Southern life, um, community, culture, and the environment, but they are extremely passionate about their respective areas of expertise. Yet, they don't um, have a particular agenda that um, they work well, we have an agenda, but it's a team agenda. It's a, a institutional agenda. So I've never worked with such a uh, selfless staff, and I'm not saying that to try to win brownie points. But um, that is really what makes McKissick special: is that uh, not only our mission, that is a very unique mission within the museum world in the southeast, but uh, the staff that I have the pleasure of working with um, uh, bring a really a um, rare combination of passion for their particular area and a humility and a, a willingness to work as a team to accomplish a goal. So, you know, I know that uh, might sound a little cliche, but uh, that's why I enjoy coming to work every day. I get to work with some fun people and I get to uh, maintain relationships with folks like Pat Aarons who are uh, unbelievable uh, uh, walking encyclopedias. I mean, uh, Pat, she has known and played with the biggest names in bluegrass music throughout the South. Uh, Bill Monroe, John Hartford, Tony Trishka. I mean, uh, the, uh, the people that she has worked with and knows on a personal basis uh, is is unbelievable and she lives right here in the Midlands uh, so anyway it's it's the people that make this uh, job really special uh, and, and getting to work with with folks like that and uh, Edward uh, I see you ask another question uh, does a restaurant like lamb's bread piece of soul meet the criteria for this it's a great plant-based menu uh, oh, yeah, I would, uh, I'm not sure what criteria you're referring to, but yeah, that certainly, I think, is what Janae is referring to, and um, uh, we can have a, a, a separate conversation about that one day over a uh, uh, tofu burger or something, but uh, yeah, uh, culinary options are many and quite varied. Uh, well, we have about reached the uh, hour limit that I was told uh, that I was forbidden from going over an hour. So I've enjoyed it. I hope uh, y'all have uh, enjoyed listening to me ramble. I look forward to uh, the museum opening up again soon and uh, getting folks back into the building. And I personally look forward to getting back out into the field and uh, meeting folks where you are and, and sitting down and uh, uh, enjoying some conversation and uh, catching up. So, um, here's to uh, the rest of 2020 and I hope it's not uh, the uh, honey badger of a year that it's been so far. Uh, but uh, enjoyed it and you can uh, contact me via email or phone anytime with questions, and I hope to see everybody at McKissick uh, sooner than later. So thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see and hear from you soon.